Hey everyone, so today I'm going to be presenting on 20th Century Poetics from the Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics. So I first want to start off with my first impression of this passage and it was, oh my gosh, what did I sign up to present because the content looked so dense and daunting. But after reading it maybe 10 to 20 times, um, I feel like I finally have a solid understanding and hopefully I can convey the information in a way to you guys where you can apply it um, when reading poetry and literature in the future. So first I want to look at what is poetics and poetics is the art of writing poetry, the study of linguistic techniques in poetry and literature. There are two fundamental assumptions of poetics on at the bottom of page 1314 and 1315. And that is that literature can neither be can be neither reduced to more fundamental constituents, for example, language, nor dissolved in any larger whole to which it may be conceived to belong, example, culture. And the second is that there exists a systematic whole of literature which takes precedence over any historical instance of it. Um, so then we look at how, how T.S. Eliot's um, work, Tradition and Individual Talent, influenced the creation of poetics in the first half of the 20th century. And Eliot suggests on page 1315 that literary tradition be conceived as the ideal order of existing monuments. Eliot's idea about poetics gave foundation for Northrop Frye's idea that poetics can be a theory of criticism whose principles apply to the whole of literature. So I think that this is kind of the main idea because um, we learn about what poetics is and um, how we can apply it to criticism and those principles, um, how we can apply those principles to literature. Um, so feminist poetics kind of has its own little section because um, oftentimes women writers or works of women are overlooked or judged unfairly. So the project of feminist poetics is founded on a constitutive distrust of spurious uni universalization, especially the spurious universalization of a literary canon almost exclusively by, for, and about men. So to remedy this problem, women form a separate community, a separate culture with its own customs, its own epistemology, and once articulated, its own aesthetics. Um, so this is on page 1315. And um, unity of individual works are challenged by feminism and Marxism. So then we look at Marxism poetics because they parallel each other in their critique of the universals. Um, so on page 1315, it says it is a central position of Marxism that no writing speaks for the whole. Rather, it is always partial and interested, always aligned. That is to that is variously expresses specifically selected experience from a from a specific point of view. So oftentimes um, women's works often gets overlooked or um, maybe we don't see specific groups um, represented like we do um, the typical white males in um, literature. So um, this is to give um, the little people a chance and it's so no one gets overlooked. Um, so poetics can either minimize the particular or mistake it for the universal. And the goal of Marxism poetics is to reaffirm the schism of individual mental life from material social life, um, which is the target of Marxist critique in the first place. And that's on page 1315. So to me, I feel like this kind of um, means that like we want to affirm the split between what we think and what we do like social life that's what we're doing socially but mentally that's what we're thinking about so overall feminist theory um, rejects pure poetics and it actually merges into cultural criticism um, to do its to do its object justice and um, since writing by women is often overlooked 
um, feminism poetics wants to integrate high and low literary art with the larger realm of cultural studies. So Professor Heflin, I feel like you have done a great job of including women writers into our course and you are doing justice to the feminist object. But we're moving on to the evaluation of poetics and we look at the interpretive we look at interpretive criticism so interpretive criticism separates the man who suffers from the mind which creates and um, i feel like this is pretty important because i feel like suffering is a pretty central theme in glick's poetry but just because she's suffering in this moment and she writes about it, that doesn't mean she's suffering in her everyday life or um, she may have moved past that specific suffering that we read about. So um, redirection of critical attention toward the medium and away from the author um, tends to devalue biographical criticism and to make formal explication of the primary task of literary study. But I feel like it also takes some of the pressure off of the poet and puts it onto the poetry. So they're not so concerned, oh, what are people thinking about me and my mental state? And more about like, what is this poet trying to say in um, her poetry. So, but I also think biographical criticism is important because we'll, we need to know what's going on in the author's life and um, what's happened in the author's background to really get to that um, underlying truth um, where they write this poetry from. But in the, liter in the theory of literature, Wellick and Warren categorize criticism as intrinsic or extrinsic, depending on whether it emphasized the individuality of a work or its place in a larger poetic realm. So when I was thinking about Dickinson and Glick's poetry, Dickinson never um, anticipated that her poetry would be published and read by the public. So I feel like we may it may be better for us to criticize her poetry intrinsically, um, especially since she's so unique. But um, Glick, she knew that her poetry would be published and she's super famous. So um, her work may be criticized extrinsically by comparing it um, to other poetry in that poetic realm. I know personally, I have been comparing Glick's poetry to Dickinson's poetry um, as I read the poems that were assigned currently. Um, but poetry often um, consists of pseudo statements and pseudo statements are really important because they are exclusively for therapeutic value. And these statements which appear in poetry are there for the sake of their effects upon the feelings, not for their own sake. Hence to challenge their truth or to question whether they deserve serious truth or to question whether they deserve serious attention as statements claiming truth is to mistake their function. So um, I feel like we can see this in Dickinson and Glick's poetry because they express their feelings um, in their poetry, often through pseudo statements. Um, and those statements are there for therapeutic value. They're not there um, for us to question whether they're true or not. So I feel like an example of this Hopefully I'm understanding this correctly, so hopefully my example is correct. But an example of this would be when Glick writes, there is always something to be made of pain in love poem. And this statement can't be proven, but it clearly elicits emotions from the readers. And um, writing this may have been therapeutic for Glick to work through maybe some of that pain, but it's also therapeutic for readers to read if they're maybe going through something similar. Um, so looking at poetics and its relationship to literary criticism, we learn that a creation, a work of art, is autolectic, which means having purpose in itself. And criticism, by definition, is about something other than itself. Um, so this dichotomy shows the direct... Um, this dichotomy shows the distinct difference between poetry and criticism. And an effect of this dichotomy was to restate the opposition between poetry and criticism. 
Um, so criticism as the defining other and literature as autolectic is that its prime and chief function is fidelity to its own nature. The aim of literature is to produce a structure of words for its own sake. Um, so this kind of reminds me of one of the secondary read in one of the secondary readings. We see Glick talks about how um, when she was a child, she just loved words and she liked putting them together and um seeing that syntax just for her own sake and for its own sake and that's what that kind of reminds me of but the autolectic character of literature implies that unlike criticism literature is not about anything it has no reference or meaning so if criticism can only intend something other than itself then literature conversely must mean nothing other than itself so poetics can no longer define literature by contrasting it to criticism. And this is on page 1317. Um, so Eliot goes against the interpretation of literature and notes that if you try to interpret it, you get fiction. Um, since it doesn't mean anything outside itself, um, if we give our interpretation of it, we are coming up with fiction. Um, so criticism of identification in which the understanding was conceived as entering the consciousness of the author. And many theorists claim that interpretation stops when readers realize what the author meant and are left with linguistic fact. Um, I know personally, if I'm reading um, something that I don't quite understand and I just go look up what it means and I find I see an interpretation, I'm like, oh, well, that's what it means. And I'm not going to look further into it. So that's a problem there. But there's another problem in that nobody can say, oh, this is the only um, interpretation of the text. There's no other way. Um, Richard says that no one can say there is only this and this and this in the poem and nothing more. But his ideas faded after the 60s and Fryer's ideas about interpreting literature as the allegory of myth rose to prominence. So allegory interpretation of myth means that the myth masks the ideas. The myth is the mask for the ideas that may mean similar things. So um, I think about, we know that Glick uses myth very often in her poetry and um, she is conveying her feelings through that myth. So even though she's not, it's not her, um, maybe not her own ideas, or like she is presenting it in a different way. And oftentimes we can kind of relate to that myth and we can have background knowledge of that myth. And that kind of adds to the meaning of what her own words, like without using myth would um, mean. Hopefully I didn't stumble over those words too much and you get what I'm trying to say. But um, we look at structuralism as another form of interpretation and structuralism makes language itself the master code. Um, so language being the master code attributes more meaning to the words themselves. And um, in these terms, poems are not made up of ideas, but words. And this also kind of goes back to the idea that um, Glick liked the words um, themselves and she wasn't so focused on like their meaning. But structuralism fulfilled the aim of, construction po of constructing poetics that would be more than the theoretical aim of exegesis, which is the critical explanation or interpretation of a text. Um, so overall, these theories kind of show that we still want to interpret literature, even if we're not supposed to. Um, but when we look at poetics and meaning, we learn that the reader is an active creator of the meaning. So um, effective fallacy explains how meanings multiply in many experiences of the reader. So if I misinterpreted this text, um, I am attributing it to effective fallacy because that is my meaning that I have given this text. <laughs>
But on page 1318, we see that it is in criticism rather than in novels or poems that the complexities of reading are more clearly displayed. And thus it is from criticism that he derives his understanding of literature in general. So I know I love to read criticism if I cannot understand a text and I like to see um, other people's ideas about the text to kind of get my own um, brain flowing and if I don't understand something, I'm definitely turned into that criticism. Um, so I think that we can use that criticism to um, derive our understanding of literature. But demand um, is led to interpret literary works as allegories, stories that can be interpreted to have a meaning, which um, that meaning is often political or moral. Um, so poetics is now largely synonymous with the theory of criticism, and that's on page 1317. And um, we see how um, the act of being critical kind of supersedes that creative, um, that creative stem. But um, the reader's interpretations can displace the author's meaning, and um, literary works can be interpreted as allegories. So we can look for those allegories in Glick's poetry um, and think, through this story or through this poem, what concept is Glick trying to get us to understand or grasp? Um, but correct understanding can be a triumph against all odds, and misinter misinter misinterpretation is a normal and probable event, um, and it's actually inevitable. So, and that's from page 1318. Um, but Interpretive language signifies the meaning of literature. Interpretation is nothing but the possibility of error. Um, Bloom claims that there are no interpretations, but only misinterpretations. Unless an interpret interpretation differs from what it interprets, it is not an interpretation, but a copy. So um, I feel like this is a really important note because we're not wanting to just copy and summarize what the author is saying. We're trying to um, get new ideas and um, get new interpretations from that text. We want multiple um, meaning. We want to find multiple meanings of it, maybe play around with which one is the right one, or is there even a right interpretation of this text? Um, so thus on page 1318, it says, truth and error, blindness and insight are inextric inextricably intertwined in the act of interpretation. And this kind of reminded me of Dickinson's um, Truth and Beauty poem, or I Died for Beauty poem, because truth and beauty are intertwined in that poem, just like truth and error and blindness and insight are intertwined um, in poetics. So, some of my final thoughts are that demand first characterized the literary as that language which invites the confusion of figurative and literal. That's on page 1318. And I can definitely see that confusion in Dickinson and Glick's poetry because half the time I'm reading, I'm like, is this figurative or is this literal? I really don't know. Um, but he suggested that literary language does not merely employ rhetoric, but self-reflexively calls attention to its own rhetorosity, and thus it knows and asserts that it will be misunderstood. So that makes me feel a little bit better about my own misunderstandings of the poetry we read in class. Um, like when I watch y'all's lectures later on, I'm like, oh, they really understood that in a different way than I did. And I feel kind of bad that I didn't quite get the meaning um, that you guys got. But um, now that I know it's kind of meant to be misunderstood, I feel better about that. Um, but on page 1319, we learn that poetic writing is only the most advanced and refined mode of deconstruction um, compared to literary writing. So literary writing is the allegory in particular of in particularly deconstructing reading. And the deconstruction is not something we have added to the text, but it constituted the text in the first place. And deconstruction is the method of critical analysis of language that emphasizes the role of language and the quality and of meaning and assumptions implied through expression like poetry. So the passage ends on the idea that deconstructive poetics epitomizes the ambition, intense self-scrutiny, and theoretical refinement characteristic of Anglo-American poetics throughout the 20th century.
So overall, I feel like this text was very informative and we learned a lot about 20th century poetics and the principles that kind of go into that. And we can use that to help us analyze and be critical of the poems or literature that we read in the future. Um, so specifically things like pseudo statements, we can kind of look for those when we read. But overall, I hope that I explained this well for you to be able to understand and apply um, in your future classes. And thank you for watching my presentation and I look forward to hearing your comments about it.